Um, so as I said earlier, my name is Sean Grant. I'm a behavioral and social scientist at the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, California in the States, but did my PhD at the University of Oxford in social intervention, so it's kind of cool to be home. For those of you who thought I might be a Brit, apologies, that happens a lot, having a name like Sean Patrick Grant and having affiliations with the UK, but I'm about as local to Santa Monica as RAND could have hired. What I'm going to do today is provide what we like to call a roadmap for the training for the next three days. We realize after doing a few of these, without doing some sort of conceptual framework up front, there is this risk of everything you'll be learning over the next three days seeming like this random assortment of practices. You wonder, when should I use them? For what purpose? And so since BITS, I think, really capitalizes uh, or really focuses on capacity building the open science movement, one of the things we thought would be helpful is creating some sort of conceptual framework for the operationalized practices that are the essential features of the Open Science Toolkit. So we call this our RT2 roadmap for this training course, and we're aiming for a transparent, open, and reproducible research workflow for your work, your empirical work going forward. But as we'll get into, we hope that you'll also help us be catalysts to make a transparent, open, and reproducible scientific ecosystem. So consider this the moment, if you're interested, uh, that you're anointed as a BITS catalyst. It's not some exclusive club. We want to increase it. So in addition to improving your own workflows, help us spread the good word. One of the things we'll be doing throughout the course, uh, in light of Garrett's survey and showing how all of us come from quite diverse intellectual backgrounds, is to give an idea of our own backgrounds and how we got into this, so you can know where we're coming from. Uh, if helpful, uh, helpful to give you an idea of why we're thinking and saying things that we're doing, to help us identify our own gaps, and also just get a feel for how large this uh, movement really is in terms of disciplines. So as I said, I'm a behavioral and social scientist, and I primarily work on what I'd call intervention research, so applied research within the behavioral and social sciences to tackle social issues primarily within behavioral health. So outside of my portfolio on open science and research transparency, a lot of my time is dedicated to either developing, evaluating, or implementing interventions, and specifically for issues like substance use and behavioral health. And it's a lot of this thinking from action research that I bring to try and make sense of the open science movement, because essentially what we're trying to do is change the behaviors of researchers and change the way that our system is organized. So the thinking that goes into doing that for problems like substance use, mental health, uh, preventive behavioral health interventions and education systems, those are the areas in which I primarily work, that kind of thinking to changing the behaviors of scientists and changing the scientific system, if that gives some insight for what's to follow. So as I said, the goal of this presentation is to introduce this conceptual framework or roadmap for RT2. Uh, I'm going to introduce the visual aid of the roadmap a number of times in this presentation that you'll then see throughout the rest of the week. And again, it's just about hoping to make sense of how everything you're going to learn the next three days fits together. So again, our hope is that you'll see this assortment of methods of tools, the things that each individual session focuses on, not as some sort of hodgepodge of practices, but a coherent set of practices for a transparent, open, and reproducible research workflow that you can do three things with. Normalize as part of every one of your own studies and projects moving forward. That's a tall aspirational order. I've been coming to these for three years now, and I just try and take bit by bit, no pun intended, with each study. Uh, so don't feel like you have to do all of this immediately. You don't create that kind of anxiety for yourself, but that's the aspirational goal, if nothing else, for your own research going forward. But then we hope that you disseminate and implement these best practices in your own research areas. So the disciplines that you identified with that you felt were or were not represented in Garrett's survey, spread the word there, especially for those practices that are not normative at the moment. And then lastly, we hope that as these three days evolve and knowing that BITS does training but also has things like smart grants and other uh, opportunities to develop new tools for open science, Think about whether there are gaps in our roadmap, which is a fairly good representation of where the open science movement is at right now, to see if there are gaps in the workflows or the wider ecosystem 
that are blind spots to us, that what we haven't even thought about yet. If, again, I think of these as almost interventions, right? And so what interventions don't even exist and need to be developed for changing researchers' behavior to be more open, to be more transparent, to be more reproducible? So that's the roadmap for the week. That's our goal for this presentation. Uh, I'll say now, jump in at any time. I have less slides than I need for the full hour, so don't feel like you need to wait until the end to raise a question, but no pressure to say anything now. It's a really awkward pillar. I hope that's slowed bearing. Otherwise, it's just very bad design. So this is the roadmap. This is essentially how we've tried to put in one pretty picture, because everyone likes pretty pictures, what we're going to address over the next few days. And I'll take these bit by bit over the next 40 minutes or so. But we think of, at the beginning, the issues that are motivating this whole movement for open science. Then think about what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve with this training and with this movement overall. And then operationalizing an organized workflow and file management with tools like the Open Science Framework and GitHub to have transparent, open, and reproducible practices at stages of study design, of conducting your study, analyzing and disseminating your study, and then hopefully archiving all of your output, thinking of information as the unit of output as opposed to just publications, which is one type of output of a research study so that people can use it in the future. Most importantly, your future self, which I'm, you'll hear a lot about over the next few days. So our motivating issues, right? These are the four factors that have really created the traction behind this movement. Researcher degrees of freedom are things you'll learn about in the next session, and it's generally leeway in the design, conduct, and analysis of studies uh, that's kind of normative, if not really common in science right now, that then allows research to act in accord with the perverse incentives that are in place in the research ecosystem right now. Publish or perish, get grants, Sexy results are the things that help get that in quite a lot of fields. So if I'm able to nudge things here or there all the way up to the point of reporting a p-value, it's really easy for me to find that signal, but we should be about rigorous methods and processes, not trying to chase certain results. Misconduct is also something that's not common, but it happens, and it can be something as uh, minor, if you will, as self-plagiarism. So repeating things, salami slicing papers, all the way up to data falsification and straight up fraud, which we know plenty of case examples of. And we hope that these practices can address that. Publication bias is where significant studies or findings or the findings that you would have hoped to expect, which maybe you'd hope weren't significantly positive, are more likely to be published than those that aren't. And so this distorts the body of evidence when we look at programs of research. And then the replication crises that I'm sure you've heard about in fields like psychology, cancer, economics, where new studies using the same criteria as an original study do not find the same result. And when all of these other things are in place, we can't say, oh, that's probably just due to sampling error or a new setting. There are other factors that could be at play. And so teasing out how to replicate findings requires addressing those three things above. Uh, there are numerous problems that threaten the integrity, the credibility, the utility of research. I really like this graph from, um, I think it was a Wellcome Trust funded movement, but I've got the URL there and the slides should be on the Open Science Framework. But it identifies things like data dredging, otherwise known as p-hacking, specification searching, omitting null results or findings or studies overall, uh, having studies that are underpowered, weak experimental designs, under-specifying your methods and your reports, and even human error or machine error, things that lead to research, any individual study, if not a review of a body of research, having questions about whether it is accurate, whether it is credible, and whether it is useful. And so to get you to thinking about this in the way that we do in terms of our roadmap, I think one thing that's important to note about these is that you can trace them along what we'd call the life cycle of a research study or project. Now this is a, a gross oversimplification of simple experiments using the hypothetical deductive method, so right, like confirmatory research, but I think it's a good place to start, where you can see at the stage of generating and specifying hypotheses, 
You might not be controlling for biases. When you're designing studies, a huge issue is low statistical power and what that means for the replicability of a finding, especially if you're using significance thresholds like P less than 0.05. Poor quality control of your study while you're conducting it and collecting your data. P hacking when you're analyzing that data and interpreting your results and then publishing those things that you think will get you that JAMA paper or you think that will get you tenure or you get you that grant as opposed to everything equally and in line with the pre-specified protocol. So these are problems, again, much like the solutions we have that aren't this random array of things, but I find it helpful to make sense of it by using some kind of framework based on the life cycle of an individual research project or study. Does that make sense? Any questions there? I'll pause now and encourage the participatory culture I'm trying to cultivate. Are we good? Okay. And so then these problems in research production at each stage of a research life cycle can lead to considerable waste in research. So this is a figure from the Lancet Reward Series, if anyone's familiar with that movement in health to improve the value and decrease the waste in health or biomedical research where they've estimated that almost up to 80% of spending on biomedical research could be conceived as wasted because of these issues. And they oversimplify it to five stages. So the questions that we pose, so maybe we're posing questions that are low priority to anyone but ourselves, right? It's just motivated by our own intellectual curiosity, and then we don't operationalize it well. Uh, particularly in trials of interventions, we're not assessing the important outcomes. And a lot of the time, studies are done without reference to a systematic review or meta-analysis. So not properly actually identifying what we in the Public Library of Science already know so that we can make sure that our questions of a new study are addressing important gaps in our public body of knowledge or information. Uh, again, designing, conducting, and analyzing studies. Things like inadequate statistical power, inadequate replications of initial observations, but instead just saying we found this in a small underpowered study, so therefore this is what we know in this area. Inefficient regulation and management of research is increasingly getting a lot of attention. Accessible full research reports, so reports that are in the public, that are open access, and then the last stage, <laughs> those that are unbiased and usable. So they accurately, comprehensively, transparently provide all the information you would need to know to assess study quality, to know to whom and under what conditions results may apply, and to replicate procedures, including interventions, if we're talking about policy or applied science. When you say unbiased, you mean kind of unbiased in the sense that the narrative is unbiased, or you mean like statistical unbiased? Uh, well, unbiased? Yeah, I do believe that's what they mean when they talk about unbiased reports. So a big thing in the health literature, which a lot of my stuff is behavioral and social science, but on health topics, spin is a really huge issue. So I've done a review recently on an intervention that I will not name, but if you look at my CV, you could do some detective work, uh, that in their primary studies didn't actually find significant findings in terms of clinical significance or clinical effects. Or in another study, the same group who developed this intervention combined two active comparison groups, including the one of interest, and compared that to a treatment as usual. The intervention that wasn't their one of interest was the one that had effects, if you actually do your own analysis of it. And then they, in the conclusion, said, we found that this and this are superior to treatment as usual, which the reader would think of, oh, the thing that they're interested in works. So there's this spin in the conclusions or discussions of a manuscript that actually distorts what the study found. So that's what they, as I'm representing a colleague's work, what they mean by uh, unbiased reports. Discussions that match the results and that include in whatever research output or body of outputs for a given project, uh, accurately, comprehensively, and transparently all of the details you'd want to know as opposed to those that support just a narrative, especially if that narrative is biased. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be a bias. I think they um, put that in column four, so whether a result is accessible as a reporting bias. This mostly refers to the content that's in the outputs. So think about an abstract section for a journal article. 
you have at best in some medical journals 350 words. I'm not sure what it's like in other areas. And so you've done a trial, even if you've pre-specified everything like the trial I was talking about did, uh, you've got 10 different results that you, you want to discuss. So what do you highlight and how do you describe it? And so knowing that most people read the abstract at best of an article, if that, has, if that narrative has spin, if it distorts, it's a tricky thing to do even of the best of intentions, right? To summarize a whole study and discussion section at best might be 20 words in some articles. But if it is clearly trying to spin things, particularly if it's in line with a potential conflict of interest that a researcher has, on the whole, this can lead to distortions of our interpretations or understanding of research. Does that answer your question? Cool. All right, scan is done. Moving on. So those are the motivating issues that the next session in particular will, I think, dive more into and will come up again and again throughout the week. But let's be optimists, right? Let's not just say, like adolescents, oh, everything sucks, nothing will be great, we're all doomed, woe is me. Let's have aspirational goals that we want to achieve. And the things that we particularly focus on here are having open materials, data, code, and access to outputs, to transparently reporting and disclosing all of the information that one might need as best as possible with the constraints of your uh, mechanism of output, so journal world limits, transparently reporting all of those things and disclosing all the information that at a minimum you know a researcher might be interested in. And Arnaud Vaganet and I will talk about this with reporting guidelines on the third day. Reproducible and replicable results, so hoping that the techniques that we are fostering here can lead to a higher rate of at the very least computational reproducibility, which means being able to get the same results that someone's reported in a paper with their own data and with their own analyses, but ideally getting a better understanding of how to replicate results and why results don't replicate with reasons other than questionable research practices, right? Reasons that are actually scientific, that increase our understanding of our phenomena of interest. And then ultimately, cumulative meta-analyses. So thinking about not just a replication of an original study and a new study, but how do we organize a body of work, knowing that really what we're interested in is the body of work on particular questions, rather than individual primary studies. What, what do you mean exactly when you talk about a uh, researcher's degree of freedom? What does that really mean? So that's, um, I wish I had this picture, and if I could remember the paper. There's a really, I have it on my phone, I'll show you during a break. But there's a great figure saying that there's a lot of attention at the, at the point of a p-value being reported in a study, right? There's a lot of attention there. But everything that leads to that, all of these stages of the research cycle, historically, there's been less attention, right? Like actually asking how you came up with the research questions that you came up with for a study. It's just taken as a given from your article. How did you design your study? How did you conduct it? How did you analyze things? There's a lot of wiggle room. There's degrees of freedom, right? You have the freedom to do things in certain ways based off of the norms and procedures of the scientific ecosystem at the moment. And that allows you to, even um, with great intentions, uh, not knowing that you're doing things that eventually distort the accuracy of your findings, leads you to fiddle with things until you might find the result that you even subconsciously wanted. All right, so if you did a study for a reason, you're hoping to find a result, you look at your data and you say, oh, this is weird. What if we control for this now? What if this is a covariant in our analyses? No, that still looks weird to me. How about we try adding this in there? Oh, now this makes more sense. And then not adjusting your p-values or reporting that you did that or reporting the results of those things, right? A lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of wiggle room, a lot of leeway. So, that's, so we're trying to, to, in openly describing and sharing the things along the research life cycle, at the very least, for those who are really keen and really interested, allow them to have an audit trail. They can go back to and say, hey, bullshit, you know, you actually did all this stuff. Or, well, when I specified the model this way, this is what I found. That's what we're hoping to do. And that's, that's addressing, in part, these, this leeway, this wiggle room in the research process, in the research life cycle. Actually, uh, you already answered part of my question. So it was so the goal here is not to control the uh, uh, degrees of freedom for the researcher, but rather just to be transparent about it, right? Uh, definitely the latter. 
Um, and I, I aspirationally think the former. Though I think one thing I would say, especially working on a project now, about the role of IRBs, Institutional Review Boards or Research Ethics Committees in this, is realizing how, again, intervention science thinking. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, you'll see that I see this as a system. Every system will be gamed. And so if we go forward thinking there's no harm that can be done with all these things that we're doing, we're going to be as foolish as the people who set up the last norms we're working on. And I think it's important to be uh, professionally skeptical as opposed to cynical or a-holes about certain intentions or solutions or whatnot. So while I think what you said is the case, I want to foster skepticism. Cool. So what does this mean for this workshop in the next three days? We're trying to change our own workflows and then ideally the scientific ecosystem at large to reach these aspirational goals. So if you go to uh, one of the BITS annual conference meetings or look at some of Ted Miguel who runs BITS presentations, he's really big on Mertonian norms, which I really like. It gives us principles to guide this whole movement. And it's really saying that the core values of science should be about universalism, about us being a community, uh, disinterested in our results in the sense that we're really truth seekers. And then that last point, organized skepticism, right? That in a healthy, professional, respectful way, it's not uh, trust me, which is the current norm right now, but maybe at the very least trust but verify. If not, show me your work, like we had to do in maths in elementary school. And the hope is that having these principles as the explicit norms, which most re researchers individually will say they ascribe to, so they, they agree with them, how that comes out in practice is something different, as we know. And that's not necessarily the researcher's fault. I don't want to play a blame the victim game here either. But this is the, if we have these principles explicitly as our North Star, guiding all the movement, all the actions we're taking, we hope that this will help advance the integrity, creative credibility, and utility of research, those problems that we're addressing. Might not solve all of them, and not right away, but we think in terms of comparing this movement to treatment as usual, that on the whole, this is hopefully a better step to achieving these goals. So we operationalized this principle, this conceptual goal, by focusing on best practices that researchers can use throughout their workflow, throughout their life cycle. So in the hope that if you take on board the practices we discuss in this, integrate them into your workflow, and that gets scaled up in some way, that we'll start to see progress on some of these issues. So thinking about these sources of waste across the research life cycle, the things that you'll be learning map on to some of these issues. So questions relevant to research, replications, and meta-analyses, thinking about, OK, what's been done? What do we know before we start the next study is a big thing. When you're designing your study, pre-registering it, developing pre-analysis plans as specific as possible, and making sure for those studies that are testing things uh, using statistical inference that there's adequate power as much as you can within your resources. For research regulation and management, tools and practices to help you organize your workflow and manage your files. For sharing your findings, having open and archived materials, data, code, and at the end of the day, open access outputs that use reporting standards in an area so you've hit the minimum pieces of information your peers have said, we, we at least want to know this. So again, try to demonstrate that this isn't a, a random assortment of tools, but they're actually addressing specific sources of waste in the research life cycle and ecosystem. So that's this yellow bit down here. And that's what, uh, as you'll see when we go forward, when someone gives a presentation, they'll specifically highlight which bit of this roadmap they're addressing. So this will be your new best friend for the next three days, your, your fall fling. So then um, I thought, it, you know, when I first went to this was thinking about all the questions I ask myself during each session. And so if helpful or if not, you know, give me better questions. Here are the things that I've asked myself and then I'll go through the tools that I use to help me answer these during each session when I'm learning a new practice. So the first one is, what is the nature or purpose of this? Why am I doing this? Why should I give a shit? Right? Why, why is this something I should integrate into my life cycle, into my workflow? 
when should I use it? Is this something I'm using at discrete stages of my workflow? Is it something that's throughout my workflow? Really operationalizing, really thinking in concrete terms about these practices so they're not abstract things that you keep reading about in articles, but concrete actions you are taking. They're actionable practices. And then also, considering that we all come from different disciplines and even within the same discipline, we probably do different types of studies, how might my application of this research uh, practice differ depending on the nature of my study? Differ depending on the discipline that, uh, if nothing else, I'm publishing with, let alone identify with. Differ with whether I'm doing a review or a randomized trial or a survey. So for the first question, you know, what is this thing? There's this tool in intervention research called Tidier, the template for intervention description and inter intervention description and evaluation, replication, something like that. Look it up, I've got the link. I can't remember the exact acronym. But it's essentially a journalist who, what, when, where, and why of an intervention. So intervention research, one of the issues with reproducibility and replicability is what the hell is the thing that you delivered? A lot of times, historically, people might have just used labels and a brief summary, which would let me know in a general sense what you tested, but if you found great results and I trusted them and I actually wanted to implement it in my practice or setting, I might not know how to do that because you didn't give me enough detail. So they ask for any intervention, this is a simplified version of it, um, to name or phrase uh, that describes or summarizes the best practice, so something like study registration, who's involved in it, what they're supposed to use and how they're supposed to use it, when they should do it, where, why, what's the reason for it, how can they apply it, and how much, how often. So just to use an example from the things we'll be learning this week, these are my notes, my brief notes on study pre-registration. So it's done by a research team, typically a lead investigator of, say, a randomized trial, and it's done for other interested stakeholders, patients that they want to recruit for the trial, which is actually the original reason clinicaltrials.gov was created, not for these kind of methodological reasons, but to let patients know of ongoing trials. Uh, what do they do? They use standardized items or a template of information to describe prior to recruiting that first participant uh, the rationale for their study, what they're trying to achieve, the methods they'll use, and then the analysis plans that they'll have. Uh, again, ideally, you want to do this before the recruitment of the first participant, so before you have your first bit of data. You can update it along the way, but at the very least, get one in before that happens, so there's some record of when you tied your hands before you're able to see your data. So I can compare what you did after you started collecting, if not seeing your data, to what you plan to do prior to that. Hopefully it's in a publicly accessible database, so something you don't control, so you can't fiddle with it on your own. So someone's Google survey or Google Docs you should be very skeptical of, because it's very easy to say, oh no, this was on January 2015 when they updated it a minute ago, versus something like clinicaltrials.gov, the Open Science Framework, et cetera, which we'll go over again later, where it's time stamped and it's out of your control. So we know at that time, that's what you had, and you couldn't change it after you registered it. Why? To provide that audit trail. Uh, it increases the credibility of confirmatory analyses. So you can feel that much more confident about findings that you get from a trial. If you tied your hands in advance, you specified your model well, you ran your study well, and you find a result, that's the type of thing that we really should put inferential weight behind. So it helps facilitate that. And like I said, it makes other interested stakeholders aware of a trial while it's ongoing. Uh, online submission by a team member, and at least once for every study, again, ideally before you recruited that first participant. So I think, I sent it, I'm not sure if it's up yet. Check with them or check on your OSF if Wi-Fi is working or when you get back to your hotel room. But I created a blank template of this. Uh, for you to use if you find this useful in each of the sessions to have some sort of organized template or framework to take notes on each of the things you'll be learning. How do you spread the fact that uh, in a lot of fields there is this kind of publish or perish uh, incentive or whatever you want to call it, uh, and the, where, where is the incentive coming from to actually do all these steps to uh, kind of be open in your research given the fact that you are kind of tying your hands in a lot of and all of a sudden you've been registered, but then your result is a no result, you're like, that's it, don't tell your 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's why uh, I don't have a pithy answer for you that'll make you feel good, but that's why in addition to saying changing your own practices, we focus on being catalysts to change the system. And uh, going through all of the different actors, entry points, things that we can do is a passion of mine, but if you can't tell now, I ramble, so I don't go into that too much in this talk, to be, but I touch on it, so happy during breaks, drinks, whatever, for anyone who's interested to chat about that more and things that I'm doing or others are doing to try and make that happen. Uh, a lot of focus right now is on getting examples of uh, uh, hiring, tenure, and promotion documents that include these as part of uh, the issues. Top group is looking at how to translate their recommendations into essentially quality indicators or metrics that could be used for purposes such as incentivizing these kinds of practices. Uh, there's a whole lot being done, but there's a whole lot left to do. So maybe a positive thing to say would be make this an area of your research and you'll be one of the pioneers and then you'll be someone that, uh, you know, when we were in grad school, those, those scientists we idolize over a round of drinks, that could be you. All right, so then after I've used Tidier to give me an understanding of what this thing is that I'm learning about, another question I usually ask, which is part of Tidier, when should I use it? So remember how we use the life cycle, the concept of a life cycle of a research study or project to map the problems? So this is from a paper in Nature Human Behavior on a manifesto for a reproducible science. Uh, people use the same concept to then map solutions. So I showed you that one picture a few slides ago. This one, this is how I've used this framework that I like to map on the things that we've learned. But you could even just focus on tools, technological advances that facilitate open science. So the open science framework has this sort of research life cycle graph from searching and discovering things, developing ideas, designing a study, Acquiring materials, collecting, storing, and analyzing your data, interpreting findings, writing a report, and publishing it. And they map onto this all of the different technological tools that speak with the open science framework at each of these stages. So again, trying to bring coherence to this movement, which particularly if you're new to it, if not you know, been in it for some time, can be really overwhelming because it's moving so fast. And all of these people are on Twitter, and every day it's like there's four new studies or things that are out there. So I like these pictures because I'm simple-minded that help me make sense to my simple mind what's happening out there and when I might use something. So we've tried to do that for this session in four main buckets of the research stage to kind of oversimplify and hope, therefore, that this applies to most, if not all, of the research you're doing. So what practices do I use during study design? And for us, that's particularly pre-registration, pre-analysis plans, and power planning. What are most related to my conduct and running my research? So how do I manage my data? How do I do version control? And then uh, really aspirational right now, having open notebooks, like lab notebooks and chemistry, using tools like Jupyter Notebooks and Docker. How do I disseminate my research following reporting guidelines? Increasing movement towards preprints to get your research out there earlier while you're waiting for that sort of feedback and typesetting from journals and open access publications. Um, if, you know, I think a lot of this and a lot of what our focus is on is uh, research rigor, but I think equity and ethics is a huge part of the open science movement. So if knowledge is power, open science is about access to power. So a lot of this is making sure as much as we can the things that are out there are accessible and that we're not creating a new system where, again, the rich get richer, where, where we're using our metrics that are more equitable across the different fields and areas of research going forward. So just quickly uh, elaborate what's a power planning is. It doesn't sound really straightforward. What a what is? Sorry? Power planning. Power planning? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's the, I think it's in a lot of training, but not really rigorous, and there are certain aspects of it that are normative now, but are getting changed and it's essentially how many participants do I need in my study to be able to detect the effect of interest. But being more mindful about things like the p-value you set or the alpha level you set, how to correct for multiple analyses, 
the level of power, what that effect estimate is that you're doing your power planning against. A lot of people use pilot studies, but pilot studies are smaller by design. So sampling error is a huge issue. So thinking about replicability, that's probably not a replicable or accurate effect if it's a small study, so you're setting yourself up. Just be more mindful about doing that according to the newer best practices, which there isn't one unified one, but uh, there's an option or there's a menu of things you could do that improve upon what's standard in quite a few fields like psychology. And then lastly, oh, sorry, go for it. I was just curious about the stages of, like, if from the very beginning you're really open about your design and shared, like, an open source software, I'm just curious, like, how do you prevent others from stealing your ideas when everything is there, so, like, this is also... Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge concern, and it's, uh, it's a viable one. I, I totally sympathize with it, if not have, you know, acted in accord with that. It's something that needs to be sorted out. I think it's an improvement to, to even have this on the radar, if not. When you share certain things is a question that's open. So the open science framework, for example, allows you to make your files pu private while you're working on it. And you can use these tools along the way so that you don't have your recall or retrospective bias saying, OK, I'm done two years later. Now let me try and remember the decision I made on March 14th, 2015. But, and so then once you're all done, and then you have say, given yourself a year after study completion, which is the policy at NIH in the States, to do your analyses that you want to do, since even though it's publicly funded, you did the work, so first dibs, then it's shared. right? So there's intricacies there that certainly need to be played out. At a minimum, we'd hope that this is the aspiration this is, um, and you'll all get to some behavioral nudges or science stuff later, that the default is opting out of this, right? That the default is you're expected to do this, and you have to justify why you're not in a given instance, rather than right now where the default is I'm not going to do this, and you have to be proactive to opt in. Implementing that is tricky, and that's where I say there is a research career and actually sorting these things out for anyone who's really keen. Sorry, I have a question about the pre analysis plans. Uh -huh. uh, because I remember that there are some types of research that we do where it's a bit complicated with the investigators like to have pre analysis plans. Right. Especially when you are doing some quantitative work or when you are doing some faculty you know, uh, studies before again getting a clear sense of what you want to do. So sometimes it's very tricky, I mean, in terms of when you do the pre-analysis plan and when you start, you know, doing the, the I mean, the data collection. Right. Sometimes you don't have much time, you know, between the two. So right. I'm just curious how actually we, we put those things together and if uh, what is stated over there means that, like, for the transparent research, it has to have all, to follow all these stuff, or should, like, part of those stuff so it's a great question and on top of how tricky it is I think another thing you've pointed on then and my experience has been a big barrier is just the time right I always think the next study I'll have everything else done and then I can really sit down and think through all these things and then study I'm working on now gets delayed another two months and so I'm rushing at the beginning of a study and then not only is it difficult to think through those things but Time is limited, as you say. Those are all truths. So, you know, I'm not going to pretend that those things aren't the case. At a minimum, the desire, particularly for those who are advocating pre-analysis plans and things like registered reports, where you submit the methods section, the background and methods section of an article to a journal prior to, prior to doing the study, and then you get peer review on that. And then once that gets approved, there's conditional acceptance at the journal. So results blind review is another word for this overall model. The hope there is that at the very least, if you do this, and as you're saying, say you end up changing your plan. Say you have a completely different analysis plan by the time you see your data, which is particularly more likely uh, in things like qualitative research where work is more iterative. At the very least, if I am surprised by your results or I want to reproduce them or I want to look into them, I'd be able to know what your thinking was along the way and then for things like randomized trials, can more clearly label those results that are truly confirmatory 
versus those that were exploratory or a plan was changed. Because right now, it's too easy to spin your results to all these things that it's called harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. So you get the result and then you pretend like that's what you thought the whole time. And then when I read it, I'm thinking, oh, like they predicted this in advance. This must be really accurate, right? So it's, again, oversimplification. Doing these things and integrating them is tough. It's complicated. And that's why I say don't do the anxious thing that I did at the first bits thing and say I'm going to do all of this right away for everything. But have it as the goal and see that even those little steps will leave you producing more credible, reliable research than probably what one is doing right now. And so then the last bit of this is then thinking about long-term storage and archiving. The person who benefits most from doing these things is future you, it's future me, right? We're trying to remember what I did a week ago uh, when that conference presentation slides were due. And so I rushed through and did these analyses. And then I spent two months not thinking about it because that stressed me out and I want to do other stuff. And then I come back and say, how the hell did I get those results that I got? And then trying to figure all that out helps you, but then it also helps others who want to uh, leverage the work that you've done. And so how to share your data in repositories is a big thing. And then having dynamic documents like R Markdown that integrate the code and the output into one. Uh, I think we're scared. Okay, we might have left. The ideal there that I've yet to see an example of, but would be awesome, is one-click reproducibility. You stored everything in a way with all of your files and all your labeling that you could press a button and every, your whole manuscript is updated if you got new data or respecified analysis. Aspirational goal. <laughs> Aspirational goal. And then how to organize all of this with tools like the Open Science Framework and GitHub to facilitate this kind of work. That's, that's what we're trying to achieve, at least introduce you to the next three days. But again, this is an active community. Don't feel like at the end of the day Friday, you know, oh crap, I'm gone, no one will talk to me, can't figure this all out. But take advantage of the fact that you have three protected days now to really focus on this and give yourself that good first start. And then one last question that I've, I've seen increasingly relevant at, at BITS in particular is, how does the use of this differ by the nature of my study? So if this were a conference of NIH-funded clinical trialists, I could get much more specific about the exact tools, the exact protocols, the exact templates. In some ways, you have to use. But we're from different countries, different disciplines, within the same discipline, do different types of studies. So while we try to focus on what we think are conceptual practices that are agreed upon for this movement, and then the best tools at the moment, those tools might change, those tools might be different for your area. So really, at the very least, walk away with appreciating the value of pre-registration generally, and know that right now, if you're a health researcher in the States doing a randomized trial, that's clinicaltrials.gov, but you know, things can change. And so in intervention research, particularly areas that I work in, uh, the stage or maturity of the evidence that I'm working on makes a difference for how I operationalize some of these things. So this is a, a, a framework from a colleague of mine at RAND uh, who works with folks at Tufts thinking about different stages of evidence, so prioritizing what we want to look at, generating that evidence in primary studies, synthesizing information on the effects of interventions, doing some cost-effectiveness modeling that then leads into recommendations for healthcare systems and providers. I do a bit on either original trials or experiments, and then particularly meta-analyses of them. And so, depending on the type of work that I'm doing, the maturity of the evidence, I might use Prospero, which is a registry for uh, systematic reviews of the effects of health interventions, if I'm doing a review. But if I'm doing a trial, again, I might want to use clinicaltrials.gov, or the Open Science Framework, or uh, the American Economic Association's registry. So the main thing I just want to say now is turn your brain on. Like a lot of the practices that are, harp that are uh, harmful in the scientific ecosystem are because we learn these rules or cutoffs that we then mindlessly apply and repeat, like, oh, P less than 0.05, as opposed to thinking through all the intricacies of it. So switch your brain on, always, be thoughtful, always going forward. It can be exhausting and tiresome, but uh, I think it leads to better outputs. As you will see on Friday, you know, you use different reporting guidelines or standards depending on the type of study that you're working on. And there might be different tools for the workflow that I'm using, different data repositories, for example, depending on which discipline you're working in. 
So in addition to getting what's the overall practice I need to know, be mindful about how am I actually going to apply it for this specific research study. So maybe for the next three days, have a pet project in mind, a pet study in mind, and be thinking about, okay, how will I translate this to this study I'm working on now? And if there's a mismatch in your mind, raise your hand, ask a question, and say, so I'm doing this, how do I apply this to this practice? Where would I pre-register this? What data, is there a data repository specific for my discipline in this? Please be participatory, we would love that, we'd love that. So it's thinking through in each of these sessions, how would I do this for my study, my pet study? So that's all the stuff about the workflow. I want to finish with some thoughts about the ecosystem, right? So like I said, ideally, you're moving forward from this to help change the way science is done in a broader level. And so using thinking from intervention research and complexity science, I like to think of research, and you're seeing this language used a lot now in this movement, as embedded within a system of social structures and institutions, right? Science is a social system. It's a complex, adaptive social system. You've got researchers who are the center of this, right? It's a researcher-centric system. It's all about ultimately or centered around the behavior of individual researchers or research teams. But they interact with other agents or actors in the system, like journals, research societies, their funders or sponsors, the people who regulate their research, the institutions in which they work, and the promotion, hiring, tenure criteria that are there, for example. And then, particularly if you're doing applied research, Congress, the media, public, getting it out there, making a difference outside of just those who do science and fund science. And so, with these different actors, there are different systems and processes within the system, different incentives and rewards, which right now, are most aligned to publishing sexy results as opposed to replicable results or trustworthy results. How things are funded. What's part of education and training? What are the ways that we disseminate the work that we do? It's a really complex system. And as we begin to change it, these actors will adapt, right? You will change your behavior if something becomes a new norm. And then these things might change, and on and on it goes. It's a very complex system, and so the question is, what's it designed to produce right now, and where can I enter it to make a difference other than just my own workflow? A great quote from uh, an implementation science presentation I saw was that all systems are designed intentionally or unintentionally to achieve precisely the results they get. So our system is designed to produce this publish or perish culture, these questionable research practices biased, unusable, and even sometimes non-existent outputs, and replication crises. The system is producing this in some way. And while it's useful to think about just our own practices, we also want to think about the capacity or capability of others to do those practices, the motivation that they have to change their practices, and opportunities to do things the right way. So our final plea is to help us get others to join as early adopters. For those who are familiar with implementation science and Rogers' diffusion of innovation, we're sort of at this stage, right? There have been some pioneers in open science who have laid the groundwork, and we're all over on this side of the hump, and there's no guarantee that this will happen. So to more effectively and efficiently get there, help us. Because we can't do this training with all of the people in your institutions, for example, or all the people in your disciplines. So help us, honestly. I think of this, again, as intervention. So think about how you can implement these products, these practices, these programs, these policies that are trying to change and target the knowledge, the attitudes, the behaviors of researchers and other stakeholders in the system. Maybe some of these are about not even changing the behavior of researchers, but changing what funders do, because then if they change, then the researchers will respond to research to the funders to ultimately make research more transparent, open, and reproducible. And that is hopefully going to advance the integrity, credibility, and utility of science. I've got to rush through these because I think we want to move on to the next thing, but happy to revisit these, chat about them later in the week. The first thing I'd recommend you think about are who are the other stakeholders. So this is a reporting guideline for uh, protocols of systematic reviews. 
and they've got this really nice table to say, hey, this isn't just for you guys who do reviews, but funders can use this as a way to say, if you're applying for funding for a review, you gotta use this template. So right at the start of the research life cycle, you're seeing this transparent practice. Guideline developers can say, let's use this checklist to see how complete, how accurate, how high quality the reviews that we're using are. Journal editors can require this at submission and say, we're not going to even consider your article for peer review unless you give us a checklist saying where you've reported each of this stuff. So while it's centered ultimately on the behavior of the researcher, think about other people on the system who, if you get them to change, then researchers will change even faster their behavior towards these transparent practices. <laughs> Some useful things to think about in doing this. Um, there's a lot of work in behavioral economics, psychology applied to public policy, et cetera, on behavioral nudges. So things that you can do that are relatively easy or cost effective that target robust influences on behavior. One of our participants has a great paper on this with uh, changing pilots' use of gas, I believe, as they take off and land. Um, and it's thinking about things like who's the messenger of this information? Someone in your research institution, your discipline, your journal is going to listen to you more than listen to me, because who the hell am I? They have no idea who I am. Incentives, norms, what's the default right? How we were talking about making these things opt out rather than opt in. The expectation is to do this, and you have to justify why you won't share your data, as opposed to the expectation being that you won't share your data, and so you have to be the proactive person to share it. So thinking through all these different influences and think which ones would work best with the stakeholder whose behavior, whose attitudes, whose knowledge I'm trying to change. And when you do that, you want to try and make these practices as easy as possible, as attractive as possible, something that's social that other people are doing, because we're people too, right? So we, we're keen to know, hey, what's cool, what's hip, FOMO, YOLO, all that stuff. <laughs> and then make it timely. It's best to implement them at the time it needs to be implemented. So if there's a request from a journal to use a checklist when you're submitting the paper, that's timely, right? That's when they need to use it by. Just think about when you should implement it. So if it's about changing our own workflows in the scientific ecosystem at large, questions to have about your own workflow, what's the nature of this practice, when do I use it, how does it use apply to this particular study. Questions to ask for implementing this in your own area. How do I disseminate and implement this? And again, think about determinants of behavior and ways to make your actions easy, timely, social, attractive. Which other stakeholders do I need to consider? Is no one talking to research ethics boards? Right? There's a gap. Let me chat with them. And are there entire gaps in this research life cycle or ecosystem that no one's even thinking about? This one I don't have an example of. This would be the thing that you say, you guys are not even talking about this. We need to do something about this. So be innovators, be early adopters. That's our hope for the next three days. And then if you join us as catalysts moving forward, then our goal is moving forward. So thanks for your time. I think there's time for one or two questions if anyone wants one. Then I'm going to very rudely jet off during the break because I owe something to someone before they wake up across the pond. But then I'll be here for the next couple of days, so happy to chat more. But I don't want to seem like an, an a-hole if I go right after the talk, so I know that's usually when presenters actually answer questions. But is there one or two sort of clarifying things? I know I rushed through the end in particular. Uh, regarding the, the method of norms, according to you, do you think that this possible to, to practice self interestedness since uh, at times you have funding for a particular project. I can remember one of uh, one of my lecturers who usually uh, asked us uh, that he went for an interview. They had an, an economist, mathematician, and a statistician. Then they had one post. When they asked the mathematician one plus one, I mean he said two. Then uh, Statistician, he said, uh, he said, statistically it can be different from. And then, then when he asked the economist, 
social side is because majority are social side. Careful what you say here. There's a lot of economists, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the economists ask, ask the manager, how many do you want? <laughs> uh, which answer do you do? So, uh, somehow, do you think uh, and uh, can practice it? It's, can be easily practiced self uh, can it be easily practiced? No, I don't think it's easy, and I think we're seeing the results of that. So I think what, if I can speak on behalf of us, and if I'm wrong, correct me, um, I think the goal is to have that as an aspiration, as something that we're pursuing, right? Like that we've agreed that we care about this, so that if we falter from that, there's a norm that makes us say, my bad, I'm going to change my behavior, as opposed to saying, well, who cares, right? This isn't something we're really about. And then on top of that, the reason why we focus on the things that we focus on is because they, in a lot of ways, address these things that drive human behavior. Scientists are people, and so if we make things like pre-registering studies, developing thoughtful analysis plans in advance, having documents that track our thinking along a study, share our data, share our code, publish open access, we create better mechanisms for making that the case than leaving it to an individual's own devices and know that all of us have, you know, roofs to keep up, mouths to feed, and so if there are perverse incentives in place for the things that are basic human necessities, on the whole, we're going to react to those. So I don't think it's easy, but I personally think it should be the goal, and I think therefore in our own practices and the things we're trying to create as normative or as the expectation in our disciplines, in the wider scientific ecosystem, thinking about how we can make those things actionable, social, timely, easy, so that people do them. And if they don't, we can correct for it. We have a mechanism to correct for it, which right now our mechanisms suck for that kind of stuff, but it's changing. As researchers, shouldn't um, the utilization of our research output also be part of the research cycle? And um, if those things um, are not implemented, are not used, the research output, isn't that also part of the research list that we talked about? Yeah, it's a really great question. So if I understand it correctly, the question is, shouldn't the utilization of our outputs also be part of this? Um, I definitely, um, on the whole, am in support of movements towards uh, thinking about impact outside the research community. My bias there is I work in probably one of the most applied areas possible, so those movements are good for me, talking about disinterestedness. So I'm open to others saying, hey, that works great for you, but this other important stuff, it actually hurts us. Um, we focus on, here in particular, the things that are entirely within your control. So there is a certain amount of research use that, for example, is based off of how well known you are or how good you are at using Twitter is increasingly, I think, a big thing. So while I agree they're important, we wanted to minimize what we focus on here to the things that ultimately are about process so that we can say at least this is something that everyone can and should be able to aspire to. And then if you can't do one of these things, it's explaining why and allowing for good reasons for that, like sensitive data, truly sensitive data that can be re-identified. Okay, last one. Um, so I just wanted to know, so like when I think of studies um, or the process of how a study comes to be, like there, there are things that are planned out that never actually take place sometimes. So I was just wondering about like at what stage do you think um, Right. Where do you start? When do you start? When do you start doing these things? Yeah, yeah. So it depends on the study, right? Um, so it's a, a bit of a contextualized answer, but to try and give uh, something other than the very unhelpful it depends answer. Um, if you're thinking about pre-registration, for example, and you're waiting on funding, 
if you want to wait to see if you get the funding, because that's a better thing to protect your concern up front about someone stealing your idea. Um, once you get funding for something and that's public and that's signaled, it, it, it allows you to have some sort of mechanism to say if someone swoops on you, hey, this was something I got funded and I put this out there, as well as probably have the leg up on getting it done before they could. So in that instance, I'd say you could probably hold off on making a pre-registration public until you've secured funding or you know you're going to do it. Right, it's like the latest you could pre-register theoretically is if I'm going to start recruiting participants in one minute and they're sitting outside that door, let me click submit before I open that door. But I guess my question was not about making it public. It's about if I want to do this, when should I start doing it? Like, because, you know, there's a point where I'm just planning and then some things don't plan out. So mm -hmm. when is a good time to sort of start documenting everything that goes into developing this? Well, I think the aspirational goal is that this is, this is kind of just how you do it always, right? So even if, even if you end up not following it, if you've documented your thinking enough so that the next person doesn't waste time thinking through all the things that you thought through, so it reduces research waste in that way. So I, my aspirational answer that I don't do, to not make you feel pressured, is immediately and always. Um, but this is where incentives and norms come into play. You can get away with waiting to do it until you have to. But I would say even at the stage of coming up with your research ideas, right away, start. I, I need to start taking better notes at meetings. I need to start doing that in a way that someone else would be able to understand. I need to do that in a way that when I close the book on something and I know I'm not going to revisit it, hey, what the hell, let me, post, let me post this online. So if someone else is interested, have at it, please just cite this document, right, which OSF gives you digital object identifiers. So even things like that could be something that's citable, which gives you an incentive, knowing that individual citation metrics are taking off for hiring and whatnot. But don't, uh, don't feel bad if you don't do it right away, because I'm still trying to play catch up. OK, last, last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah my, my question is about uh, what happened to commission research. Yeah, maybe somebody has commissioned you to do something, and when it comes to publication, or even writing, uh, the institution or the individual wants you to highlight, and that maybe comes back to what you're talking about initially about biasness. Mm. To highlight some areas and not others. So mm. sometimes as a researcher, you, you're in a dilemma to, well, the, and I think it's also an, an ethical question. Hmm. I think, I mean, for me, I think that really is a great one for this last bit, right? I've never thought about, I mean, institutions are kind of a new frontier for this that a lot of groups like BITS, Center for Open Science are starting to target and say, hey, you know, if it's talking about incentives, researchers will really immediately react to their line manager saying, you've got to do this stuff. But I think a gap there is thinking about, well, what are the practices that need to be de-implemented? So not just adding the expectation to do open practices, but what are the things that they currently do that facilitate spin and bias? So I don't really have an answer for you. I think, it's a, I think it's an interesting question, right? I'd be curious, for example, thinking about how to do this as a study. Take this one. I'm not going to do it. Surveying institutions or researchers and asking them, so how many of you have been asked by a media person at your university or a line manager to spin your results in this way? It's happened to me and to like really detrimental effect because the person basically described one study as something else. Um, and it led to a lot of angry emails from those who read it. And I had to say, this isn't what the study was about. So I'd say yes to that. I don't think there's any data on that. And then use that as a way to think through, okay, what are the drivers of that behavior? How can I get them to change? So I, uh, not a helpful answer to you, but I'd say, if you're keen on that, I think that's a, that is a killer area that seems to be a blind spot right now, de-implementing harmful policies at institutions that lead to non-reproducible science. Yeah, and it also follows that, because I'm just giving a, uh, an example that happened. There's a research that was commissioned by, in Kenya we have the national government and the county government, one of the county governments. It's like the regional uh, or provincial or something. And when the research, uh, it was on a certain project. So, and we found uh, some negative impact on the project, and we gave them uh, the report. 
but what appeared in the newspapers was something which was very different from what they had. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, so the two things that come to mind, uh, what's written in contracts is really important. That's a big thing where I work, is making sure, like, since we do a lot of high-stakes sensitive stuff, that you're, at the very least, you're, we're make sure we answer the question you want, but from there, we're doing this the most rigorous way we can. And then secondly, that media spin <laughs> happens. There's a recent example of a study that came out of the UK on uh, drinking while pregnant, and the... I think it, I can't remember which newspaper, and I won't say it, so I'm not open to libel. Uh, said it in a way that the researchers disagreed with, and said you're misrepresenting our study. And so, if the researchers are right, many people, most people who read it, will only remember the article and think, "Oh, I can drink this much when I'm pregnant." It happens, and so that's why it's important to not just only focus on our own workflows, but think about that wider system and say, "A lot's got to change, and it's not going to change." at least quickly and effectively if we don't coordinate and create this grassroots movement. All right. I am going to cruise. I think there's a tea or coffee break. Free coffee break. At what time? Uh, so okay, so you got about 10 minutes, chat. I'll be back later today and later this week, but you're all awesome. Really excited for this week. Thank you.